political stability. Even more important than maintaining political stability was generating popular support. By 2005, Sri Lankan population had gone from war to peace and back again. There was a lot of cynicism and war weariness in the public at large. If the government had focused only on the war, it, it was entirely possible that the people would not have supported the war effort. This is one of the reasons why the government invested so much on welfare efforts, efforts even at time when it could hardly afford to because of the large war budget. Did not ignore these responsibilities. Instead, they skillfully engage in multifocal governance where the other critical national requirements were met, while the focus on the military campaign was not in any way reduced. Along with these domestic issues, another key factor underpinning the success of our operations was the management of international pressure by the political leadership. In 1987, the enormously successful Vadamarachi operation had pushed the LT to the brink of defeat. However, these operations could not be sustained because of Indian government intervening. The primary problem in 1987 was that the relationship between the two countries had not been managed very efficiently, effectively. In contrast, from the time of his election, President Rajapaksa went out of his way to keep New Delhi brief about all the new developments taking place in Sri Lanka. He understood that while other countries could mount pressure on, you, on us through diplomatic channels or economic means, only the India could influence the military campaign. From very early, in the military campaign, the relationship between Sri Lanka and India was managed through maintaining a clear communications line at the very highest level. A special committee was established to engage in constant dialogue. The Sri Lanka side comprised then senior advisor to, Mr. to the President, Basil Rajapaksa, Secretary to the President, Mr. Lalit Viratunga, and myself as the Defense Secretary. The Indian side comprised former National Security Advisor, Mr. M. K. Narayan, the foreign, then Foreign Secretary, Sri Shivasankar Menon, and then Defense Secretary, Mr. B. J. Singh. This Troika had continuous discussions and ensured that whenever any sensitive issues arose, they would be resolved immediately. The government also ensured that our relationship with other important regional allies and other friendly countries were well maintained through usual diplomatic channels and regular dialogue. Ultimately, this able management of critical international relations was another key success factor in the eradication of terrorism. Unfortunately, it has to be noted that influential figures in few countries outside the region were skeptic about the government's decision to reopen a military campaign against the LTT. There was many reasons for this. A key reason was a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of the LTT and the necessity to eradicate it. I spoke uh, earlier about the numerous atrocities and human rights violations carried out by the LTT. Unfortunately, the LTT also had a great deal of global influence through some elements of the Tamil diaspora, which played a significant role in the electoral politics of certain Western nations. 
This influence, combined with the skill of the LTT propaganda machine, was strong enough to create a false competing narrative in which the LTT assumed the guise of a liberation army for an oppor oppressed population. This is far from the truth. While it is true that the LTT's first major attack on an army convoy in 1983 sparked riots in the south during which the Tamil community suffered at the hands of violent mobs, Sri Lanka as a nation grew up very rapidly after that incident and left those dark days far behind. The progress made in national reconciliation and in integration since 1983 has been very encouraging. For a long time, even at the height of terrorist activities in the 1990s, when thousands of innocent men and women and children were killed on a yearly basis by the LTT's bomb blasts and attacks, there were no more backlashes against the Tamil community. On the contrary, the majority of the Tamil population has lived outside the North and East for many years and comprise an integral part of the Sri Lankan community and the national identity. Colombo in particular is a thriving multi-ethnic hub that boasts a large Tamil population which has produced many of the nation's leading professionals and businessmen. They, they led lives of distinction in a supportive multicultural environment devoid of communal tension and have done so for many years. Nevertheless, the LTT's propaganda machine kept flogging the lie that the Tamil community would have no chance to prosper so long as it stayed within the Sri Lankan state. They demonized Sri Lankan society, particularly the majority Sinhalese, and made ludicrous claims about ethnic cleansing and genocide. The irony is that, in actual fact, it was the LTT itself that perpetrated such atrocities in its attempts to carve out an insular monoethnic state. It was the LTT that drove the Sinhalese and Muslim out of the North and East virtually overnight. And it was the LTT that held Tamils captive and made them suffer so for many years. If any Tamil children did not have the opportunity to study and forge better lives for themselves, it was because they lived in LTT controlled territory and were conscripted as frontline soldiers or suicide bombers at the tender age of 12, 13 or 14. If any Tamil families spent many sleepless nights fearing for their future, it was because they lived under the LTT and had no prospects at all for a better life. If successful Tamil businessmen and professionals were forced to maintain a low profile in the rest of the country, it was because they feared being kidnapped and held for ransom by LTT operatives. The, the main of the Tamil community in Sri Lanka was not the Sinhalese, nor the armed forces, nor the government. It was in fact the LTTE. That is ultimately why we called our efforts to liberate the North and East a humanitarian operation. We were not just liberating territory from the LTTE's control. We were rescuing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians from its cruel grip. By combating the LTT, conclusively defeating it, we were not just winning a long drawn out war against an old enemy. We were rescuing an entire nation from the constant threat and hellish horrors of terrorism. 
A second problem that some observers in the international community had with the resumption of a military campaign in Sri Lanka was the issue of proportionality. These observers unfortunately lack the perspective necessary to understand the true nature of the LTT. They thought of the LTT as a small organization, essentially no more than an underdog standing up to a full might of a national military. Again, the LTT's propaganda machine played an important role in the fueling this misconception. The truth of the matter is that despite its modus operandi of terrorism and its origins as a small band of militants, the LTT had grown into a massive terrorist organization that had the ability to stand up to the Sri Lankan armed forces over the years. On previous occasions, the LTT had enjoyed several victories over our military. They had overrun the Poonarin military camp in 1993 and the Mulatiu military camp in 1996, killing several thousand troops. From 1998 to 1999, the LTT scored several key victories against the armed forces, killing thousands of troops and recapturing a great deal of territory. In the year 2000, the LTT captured Elephant Pass, which was held by nearly 12,000 soldiers in a major operation. All in all, by the time our military campaign resumed in 2005, the LTT had killed more than 26,000 armed service personnel. This was no small band of militants, but a large, sophisticated military force comprising approximately 30,000 carders, a very large arsenal of weapons and equipment, and thousands of civilians organized as auxiliary forces. The LTT is the only terrorist organization in the world to have had a sophisticated naval league as well as a fledgling air force with aircraft capable of dropping bombs in Colombia. Those who thought that the Sri Lankan response was disproportionate had absolutely no perspective on the issue. Unfortunately, because Sri Lanka is a small country with limited resources, it was not possible for us to give the management of non-critical foreign opinion the same level of attention we gave to India and other key nations. As such, these misconceptions remained largely intact. Even more sadly, a number of influential figures in the international community formed very strong opinions, or should I say, jumped to very hastily conclusions about our conduct of the war. Some of these assumptions and misunderstandings have proven hard to shake even to this day.